Hello everybody and welcome to another Microsoft Flight Simulator video. Today we're going to be learning all about the G1000 and how to use its different functions and even how to bring the aircraft in for an ILS landing at the end of this flight. Before we begin guys, if you would like to see more Microsoft Flight Simulator content, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you know whenever I upload a new video. I also have a Discord, the link is in my description. And if you would like to find other people to fly with in Microsoft Flight Simulator or just to talk with other people about it, feel free to join. I'm always looking for new members. So let's get right into this video. All right, so we're now in the cockpit of the Cessna 172 Skyhawk G1000. And um, we're sitting here at Gastonia Municipal, and we're going to make a quick flight down to Spartanburg, South Carolina. So let's go ahead and get all of our electronics on and avionics and stuff like that. So I'm going to flip the master battery on. I'm going to go ahead and start my engine. So I get the beacon light on, get the nav and strobes. This isn't really a full flight tutorial, so I'm just going to do this quickly. There we go. Get the engine up and running. All right, and guys, before we begin even flying at all, let's go ahead and take a look at what we have in front of us. So right here in front of us, this is the actual Garmin G1000. It's a very sophisticated piece of technology meant for aircraft. And um, these this piece of technology in real life goes for like, I looked it up and it varied, but somewhere around $50,000 just to get this implemented into your aircraft. I saw some for 20000 but I didn't know what was an exact value. And I just assumed the 50000 because this is a very interesting piece of technology. All right, let's go over what each of these buttons do right here. Starting in the top right, all this does is it increases your nav audio level. I don't think this has any effect on the simulation at all, so I really just don't mess with this at all. This right here, this next button down, the arrows, this is what's going to switch your nav 1 from your inactive to your active. So if I press this, you'll notice these two switch right here. Next down, we can. This is what we use to tune our standby frequency. So if I, tr and this has two knobs on it. One is the the bigger one on kind of on the inside, and the smaller one on the outside. If I turn this bigger one, then it's gonna you know just that one one two changes to a one eleven, and then one ten, and so on and so forth. And the inside knob changes the inside number by fives. So sixty five, sixty, fifty five, fifty. This is your standby frequency, the one that's in white, and your active one is the one over here that's not changing. And again, to switch them, it's these arrows. The next button down is your heading. And this is what you use to select your different headings. And you'll notice right here on our little compass down here, we have a little blue thing. And as we twist this, it moves. And that's gonna show where your aircraft is going to turn towards. It's gonna try to align this top white arrow right in here. You see it kind of fits. And if you press in on it, it'll sync to your current heading. So just like that. So it doesn't matter where this is. If you press in the middle, then you'll sync it just like that. Also on the nav, you can toggle between nav one and nav two by clicking in the middle. But I, that's something else that I don't really use. Next down is we have a whole group of buttons. And we're really gonna see what all these buttons do once we get in the air. But this first one is obviously AP, it engages the autopilot. This next one is the flight director. You can go ahead and turn that on if you wish. That just brings a little purple thing right here, and it shows where your aircraft is going to go. This is heading hold. This one is altitude hold. This one is your nav mode, which is what you're really going to use. It's kind of like your, um, your VNAV, or not really your VNAV. This is VNAV right here, but this is your lateral navigation, like LNAV. And we're really going to use that once we get in the air as well. VNAV, I really don't use at all. Um, but that's what that button is. This is your approach switch, which is what you're going to need if you are going to perform an ILS landing. This is your back course mode on, and it pretty much allows you to do a reverse ILS. This is your vertical speed. And these buttons right here, the nose up, nose down, lets you adjust the vertical speed. And this is flight level change. Flight level change is something that you really will have to kind of get used to. It's a very useful function. I love using it. Um, it's just, it's one of those things that can't really be explained until you see how it works. 
All right, moving down, the very bottom knob, this is your altitude hold. And if you notice, whenever you switch, um, whenever you turn this knob, it's got, it's again, it's kind of like the nav. It's got an inside larger knob and an outside smaller knob. Whenever you turn this knob, it's going to change this blue thing right here, right above your altitude indicator. So if I turn this inside knob, it's going to go up by 1,000. So there we have 4,000, 5,000. If I turn this smaller knob, it'll go up by 100, as you see there. Next, going along the bottom here, we have inset, which I'm not even sure what that does. Never used it. PFD. Um, and we have CDI, which is a very important uh, aspect of the Garmin G1000. What this does is it, you see how it says VOR1. Well, if I click CDI, it goes to VOR2, and then it goes to GPS. Those are your three options. We're going to need to use CDI when we do an ILS landing, and we're going to need to leave it on GPS whenever we are actually flying the route. ADF DME, that's just distance measuring equipment. You don't really, I, I've never used that either. XPDF, XPDR, that is your squat code. So if you're not really serious and you don't want realism, then you don't need to do this. But essentially you enter your squat code here. So it can be like that. And then right here you can turn it. It's on standby right now. You can turn it on standard alt just like that but you don't really have to worry about it because when the tower reads you your squat code it'll automatically fill it in right here alright TMR slash ref this is just your references so we got our glide slope here um, or not glide slope just the glide the rotate the um, I assume this would be uh, I think VY is your best climb rate VX I'm not really sure what that is Maybe your best descent rate. I'm not sure. Somebody um, correct me on that. Nearest. This is just your nearest airports and alerts, which we have none. All right, moving on over. This is our FMS right here. Um, where you can't use this knob unless you press one of these buttons here. So let's go over these buttons. Starting in the top left, this is your direct to course. Um, if you enter a runway, or not a runway, an airport and hit activate, then it will go directly to it. It's kind of similar of what I've got going on with Spartanburg right now. This is your menu, and I'm not sure why it's not even working right now. Flight plan. This is simply your flight plan that you can change. Now see, I've got mine in. It's just direct to KSPA. Procedures. This is what we're going to need to use when we were on that ILS approach so we have select approach here we can also select arrival or select the departure and this is uh, again for ILS procedures so we could take a SID out of here and then this is clear cancel remove and enter and accept and if we have this procedures page up then we can move around this knob now this has two knobs again just like our altitude select so the bigger knob on the inside is going to select these and the smaller one is going to select um, letters and stuff so we can really see that if I go to direct and I go up here and then I start moving this smaller curve so you see it now changes so K and then to move over we use the bigger knob and then if we enter an S and then use the bigger knob to move over and then I need a P which is right there and then finally I need an A right there alright and then after you enter your direct 2 you simply hit enter and then enter again to activate there we go alright moving up this is your range of your little map which I'm not even sure why my little map is not working right now um, typically you'd have a map right here maybe it'll show up later but it's how you adjust the range for it if you do have it this right here is your course. This is again two knobs, one on the inside, one on the inside. I mean, um, outside. The smaller knob adjusts your course. So if I go back to VR, VR1, then we see it's now spinning around the compass, and our course is also changing right here. The inside knob is your barometric pressure, so your altimeter, and it's indicated right here, 3001, or I could drop it back down to standard going up this is your comm and this is similar to the nav 
but it changes your communications, your standby, and it's again an outside knob and an inside knob. So if I change this inside knob, then it's gonna change the bigger number, so 126, 127, 128, shown right here in the standby frequency. And the inside knob, again, changes it by five, so 50, 40, 35, 30, 25, 15. Okay, sometimes it does skip and goes to tens, but you don't have to worry about that. That is there for a reason. And this arrow just switches your inactive comm to your active. And this is the audio level. Now, with air traffic control, I'm pretty sure this literally does nothing. So again, it's not even simulated. Um, you can also press in on this, uh, you know, the comms where you change the frequency. And it'll switch to comm too. Just like that. So I've figured out why the map isn't here. It's this inset button. When you click this inset button, it does pop up the little map here. And yours should already be there, but if not, you can go ahead and click this inset button there, and then hit the back button there. PDF, you can bring up a wind information, like option one, two, three. And it just shows you your winds, and that's very useful. I didn't even know that until now. So if you want to visualize your wind, um, option three looks like it has the most information. So I'm going to keep that up there. DME, you can toggle that. It's just your distance measuring equipment. This is your Nav1 data. And you can turn it off as well if you like. And you can change the arc right here, or your compass. I recommend leaving it on the 360. And then I think this is Nav2 and just your um, the distance it looks like but we don't need that because our distance is right up here. All right, now on the actual screen of the Garmin G1000, starting at the top, this is your next waypoint, but for me, I just have direct to Spartanburg. Shows us our distance, 43 nautical miles, and BRG, I'm not sure what that is, but um, I believe it's the heading of where the airport is, so I need to fly at 254 degrees. And this is your comms nav over here. This right here is your autopilot information, so nothing's on, but if I hit that AP, then AP will show for autopilot. If I turn on flight level change, flight level change at zero knot, we'll get into that more. Vertical speed, um, navigational mode, VOR, or if I change this to GPS, it switches to GPS, stuff like that, but we'll get into all that once we get in the air. All right, over here, this is your standard <coughs> aircraft information so right over here we have our indicated airspeed on the opposite side this is our altitude our heading is going to be right above the compass right here and um, we got our true airspeed down here an altimeter <coughs> and then this is our false horizon this entire thing right here so that's going to do it for this screen right here let's move on to All right, the so screen. this uh, middle panel here is something that you'll likely never use because it's just common mics and um, Com threes and a PA system, a passenger address system, a speaker. It's just a bunch of like um, sound related stuff. So aux, yeah, not used. I mean, there's nothing pilot intercom. So you'll likely never use this panel. It's just simulated just to be in here, you know, for added realism. But this um, Garmin right here on the co-pilot side is literally the exact same buttons. We have our nav heading, our autopilot, controls, altitude, um, and same way on the right side over here we have the communications, our course, range, and our direct twos and our menus and flight plan, all that good stuff. So it's literally identical to this one over here on the left. But um, the only thing different about it is it's actually just a map. It's not your false horizon, altitude, or airspeed, or anything. It is just a map, and it's we've got our engine RPM, our oil pressure, oil temperature, and all this stuff. We have our fuel right here, engine hours, and our electricity is displayed right here. And um, we can actually ex uh, zoom this out or in using this range knob over here. And if we zoom out, we see we have our straight line directly to Spartanburg. But uh, yeah, that's really about it for this screen. It's really useful. You can zoom this in or out just to see how far away you are from your destination. And um, wow, I didn't even know it gives you an estimated time and route right here. A track, 
a DTK, which I don't even know what that is, and ground speed is shown right here. Also on this, uh, the main one, the PFD, if you now change that range, it changes the little mini map right here, I guess you could say. So that's really useful. You can like zoom this in to see taxiway markings and leave this one zoomed out, or vice versa, you can zoom this one all the way out to see your progress, and you can zoom this one in to see taxiways and stuff like that. Alright, so that's really it for going over what the different functions, or not the functions, but what the buttons are on the Garmin G1000. So I'm going to go ahead and taxi to the runway and we can set some more stuff right, up. We are there. now holding short of runway 3, I believe. Yep. And we need to set a few things up before we go. And um, actually, we really only need to set one. Go ahead and set your altitude. And for short flights, I like to set it to about 4,500. And um, if you're not familiar with VFR flight, you always cruise at a um, thousand number plus 500 feet. And it also depends on whether you're going east or west. Essentially, if you're going west, you want an even thousand, so four or six or two plus 500, and if you're going west, you want an odd thousand, so 1,000, 3,500, 5,500, stuff like that, but that's some more advanced stuff. All right, and once you have your altitude set, you want to make sure you want to come down to the CDI and click on this and make sure it's the purple one with that says GPS. If you don't have it as GPS, we don't have any VORs plugged in, so it's not going to do anything. So we want it set to GPS. I'm going to show you what it does. I'm going to leave mine on VOR1. I'll show you what it does if you don't have that set. All right, and essentially what we want to do after we take off is um, engage the autopilot, and I will show you what it's going to do. So let's go ahead and get on the runway and take off. We've got about a 20-minute flight, but I will skip in between when we are at cruise. All right, let's go ahead and lift off. Wow, my frame rates are doing really good right now. I'm impressed with it. Although I need to improve my textures. You see this kind of blurry lines on the runway. Also, I don't know why it pulls so far to the left. Um, I understand torque, but I don't think it's that bad in real life. Like, my gosh. All right, guys, we are going to go ahead and pull back on the stick. There we go. We are now in the air. Trim it out, get a nice climb rate here, about 5 degrees. Alright, and you don't want to engage autopilot at all when you're as low as I am, because it's going. what it's going to do is it's first going to level you off, and I don't think you want to be flying this low. So, we're going to climb a little bit, maybe up to 1,500 before we engage this autopilot. and. The ideal climb speed in a Cessna is 74 knots, and that's what we are kind of at right now. <laughs> Ooh, my frames are dropping now. I hate these stutters. It stutters like this, but then it'll smooth itself out. Alright, I'd say we are now high enough. So what we're going to do is engage the autopilot. And man, I wish these stutters. There we go. See, now it's nice and smooth. All right, now we can engage the autopilot, and what it's going to do is don't be alarmed. It will, um, it's going to try and level you out just like that. All right, now what we want to do is, well, why is it not climbing to 4,500 feet? Well, we got to engage either vertical speed or flight level change. Now I'm going to engage flight level change, and after that you'll notice it starts to pitch up and this is changed right here now this is flight level change and it says 107 knots essentially what the aircraft is going to try to do is it's going to try to keep me as best as possible at 107 knots and it's going to try to get me to 4,500 feet so essentially I should be full throttle right now so it, my aircraft will continue to climb and the aircraft will have to pitch up in order to reduce my speed to keep it on 107. Now if I switch over to vertical speed here, we've got zero feet per minute, it's just going to hold me level, just like this. But if we do this nose up, then 
it's going to start increasing. You'll see VS 300 feet per minute. If I go again, 400 feet per minute. So that's kind of a more, and here we go with the stutters, that's more of a um, precise increase in altitude. All right, and you'll notice we're now flying the direct opposite way of where I need to be. Now, if I activate that nav, this nav mode right here, then it's it's on the localizer actually right now. So if I switch it to VR2, you notice it's not going to go anywhere. It's not turning to where we need to go. But if I hit it again, the CDI button to GPS and engage nav, well there we go. Now it is banking right towards, it's going to try to get us on this purple line right down here. Alright, and if you want to, you can use heading hold, and I'll show you what that does real quick. So if I move my heading, you see our blue things over here south. So if I engage heading, then the plane will start banking and align itself with that blue strange shape, just like that and it'll level itself off level the wings at least just like that and I can actually turn back this way if I want to by moving the heading bug over to the right and it's going to bank to the right so there we go that's heading now altitude hold which is right here if I engage that right now then it's going to lock my current altitude so see 2200 feet. I just pressed it and it's just going to hold me at 2200 feet. If we need to climb or descend, we're going to need either flight level change or vertical speed. So if I turn on flight level change at full power, the aircraft is going to try to hold at 107 knots. And you'll notice this is kind of more shaky. So sometimes I use this, but generally if you're in some wind and some kind of rougher conditions like rain or something, you don't want to use flight level change because it will be bobbing up and down like crazy. I would recommend to use a vertical speed and just put the nose up to about 400 feet per minute and that'll be just fine. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and engage the navigational mode just like that and we will get on route. Alright, so the aircraft is about to cross this purple line here and you'll notice it's going to start banking just like that to line itself up with the purple line. This is with GPS enabled down here and nav mode on. And by the way, this line right here, it needs to be totally like a straight line. If my aircraft is like over here or the line was like over here, then that means we are too far right of the line. And if the line was over here, we are, we are too far left of the line essentially. So now we see it's starting to get straight up because we are almost on this purple line here and it is a straight line pointing straight forward which is exactly the direction that we need to go alright guys so now you see the aircraft has leveled itself off at 4500 and we no longer are using flight level change or vertical speed now the same applies if we do want to descend so here we are 4500 feet and if we use our altitude knob down here and just if we want to go down to say 4000 then we can engage that and then engage flight level change and this time it's going to try to hold us at 96 knots and you'll notice it's not really moving it, we're not descending and it's because we are holding at 96 knots but watch what happens if I cut the throttle now it points the nose down because it's trying to gain airspeed and get us down to 4000 feet and again this is going to be a little bit shaky but you can correct this if you give it a little more power and there we go now it's going to hold us at 4,000 feet so that is really how flight level change works it's going to try to hold you at your speed while trying to achieve the altitude that you have selected another tip on the Cessna you notice that my RPMs are kind of running low right here um, and the fuel flow GPH is kind of in the green but if I pull this mixture out a little bit now the RPM has increased
just like that. You want to find that sweet spot, uh, this little arrow. You want to get it as close to 20 as possible. And now our RPMs are a lot higher. And I'm able to um, go faster. All right. And I will see you guys when we are closer to the airport. We're almost halfway. All right, guys, some other important things to note is if you do have flight level change engaged like I do now, with uh, it's holding at 104 knots, trying to get up to 4,500 feet. If you do use this nose up and nose down, you can actually decrease this airspeed. So if I do nose down, it's going to decrease it to, like, say, 95 knots. Well, it's going to pitch the aircraft up, so it's going to slow it down to 95 knots and try to get up to 4,500 feet. The same is true if you're trying to descend. If you want to nose up and hold it like 121 knots, well, it's going to try and both keep you at 122 knots and try to get you to 4,500 feet. So that is something important to note there. Another thing is if you do click in on this range map, you can toggle a cursor, and now you see we have a little mouse right here and we can actually use these arrows and pan the map over that way or we can go down and just press it again to center back on your aircraft same way with this map if you press in on the range button then you have a little mouse and you can use the arrows to move the map over this way or you can move it down and you just click it again to center it back on your aircraft just like that so those are some important things to know if you ever want to use that feature. Alright guys, so let's do some ILS preparation before we do get close to KSPA. Now the first thing you want to do is um, set up your approach and the tower will tell you which runway to use but for, this, for the sake of this tutorial we are going to just use runway 5 which is the only ILS approach at KSPA. So what you want to do is hit this procedures page here and then hit enter for select approach and then we see ILS 5 if you did want to change this what you can do is use the outside knob the smaller one and see we can select ILS 5, RNAV 5 or RNAV 23 and we use the bigger knob to select either of these and then we just press enter All right, and then we can um, toggle the cursor see there's nothing that's blinking right now and that's because we need to press in on this knob as well and that toggles the cursor just like that and you can also select your transition but the only thing is SPA here and then once you select your ILS you can go over to activate and press enter and now what this is going to do is it's going to change our course as we see here this is going to essentially you can think of this as like a star We've got our transition, which is SPA, and then it's going to bring us around like this and then back right into the runway, which runway 5 is going this way. But if you want to skip this SPA transition, what you can do is engage, just, just engage heading hold and um, skip it, essentially. So I'm going to turn it that way and engage heading hold. So now it's going to go this way. And from here on out, you will have to use heading hold um, unless you go into your flight plan and adjust some, or you can just go direct to like means or something. But there's no issue with just using heading hold, so that's what I'm going to do. All right, the next thing we want to do is we need to actually get our nav and our course for this runway. And what I like to use is Sky Vector. Now, Sky Vector is a totally free thing that real world pilots actually use. And it's it gives you every single airport in the world or the United States, either one. Um, but the link to Sky Vector will be in the description. And what we want is KSPA. So I'm going to type in that code right here on the top left search bar and hit go. And it centers our little tiny crosshair on KSPA, which is right here. And also, if, you're, if yours doesn't look like mine, it looks something like this or this. I'm using World VFR right here on the um, presets, the layers or whatever. Um, actually, the layers right here, I'm going to turn off the TAFs, or the TFRs, I mean, to get rid of that red. All right, so once you find your airport, what you want to do is hold your mouse over to make sure it is correct, and we see KSPA, Spartanburg. And then we want to right-click on it 
and we have some information here. If you hold your mouse over the highlighted blue, we have our instrument per per approach procedures, departure procedures, and standard standardized terminal arrival, which is your star. All right. So I'm using ILS Runway 5, but yours is more than likely going to be different. And then click on that, and, what's it go and then it's going to bring up a chart just like this. Now the only information that we want is the localizer frequency and the course. And this looks like a lot, and it is kind of advanced. It's for instrument pilots. But um, if you do want to perform an ILS landing, all we're going to need is this right here, which you see it says lock and then 109.1 .1, and then approach course 047 that, those are the two things that we need right there so let's go put them in our aircraft so 109.1 .1, that's going to go up here in the nav so we're going to use our knob here to get 109 and then we need 0.1 which is 0 0.10 use the outside knob for 0 0.10 and then go ahead and switch those over to the active all right, and next what we need to do is um, I'm going to go ahead and start my turn here to the uh, left to get in line with this white line here. Next, what we need to do is set our course. And we are going to use VOR1 to set up our course. And that's probably good right there. Um, because if you notice... If we try to adjust our course, which is right here under CRS, Barrow, if we use the outside knob, our course is not changing, indicated by this right here. It is not changing at all. Now this is because GPS actually controls your course. So what you need to do is um, engage, you, what you want to do, here's a little trick. You synchronize to your current heading, just like that, and then you engage heading hold, which I already have on, but if you were on the GPS, and then what you want to do is come down to the CDI button and click it. And now you'll notice it says lock one. This is localizer. And that's what you want to see. You do not want to see VOR2. You want to see lock one. Well, now we can adjust the course. All right. And the course is 47 degrees. It's shown right here beside the localizer frequency. So mine is actually one off. Um... I'm not sure why it's not changing actually. I think it's because I already input the frequency. So if I change that, yeah, okay. So change the course before you input the frequency or wow, so it kind of it got really close to setting that course. But anyway, go to VOR1, take the frequency away and then set your course and it's going to spin it around just like that. So we had 47 and then you can switch your frequency back. And um Wow, I just changed to 4.8. Huh, I wonder if the G1000 auto sets the course. I didn't know it did that. If somebody in the comments wants to uh, correct me on that, that would be great. But yeah, it looks like it automatically set our course there. But from here on out, um, you can, if you want, go back to your GPS and engage nav mode again. But I am not going to do that. I'm just going to keep it on heading and keep it on localizer 1. So that is all you need to do. Um, going over those steps again, you just go to procedures, select your approach, ILS 5, and um, then you need to obtain the ILS frequency from Sky Vector and the course and input it into here. And remember, if you can't input the course, it's because your GPS is active. It does not allow you to select the course. What you want to do is just head over to VOR1, and that'll be shown if you don't have the frequency in yet, and then you're able to change your course but it looks like it does actually select the air course for you. All right, so for approaching the runway with ILS, you want to make sure this is localizer one, just like that. And another thing, you want to go ahead and start descending because the runway is actually right there, and we are very high up. In order to catch this glide slope, you want to be um, decently low. So I'm going to go ahead and descend down to about, let's go 1500. And I'm going to engage flight level change and descend like that. This is a very quick way to descend if you just cut your throttle. <laughs> All 
All right, and we can enjoy the scenery. Looks very nice. All right, I'm gonna use this. Now, again, with my Airbus, if you watched my Airbus ILS tutorial, I told you that you always want to be lower than you think you need to be, and you want to be further out than you think you need to be. Because it looks like we are pretty far away from the airport right here. But if I go to the outside, it's right there. It's pretty close, actually. Alright, I'm going to get on an intercepting course, and if you guys did watch the Airbus ILS landing, I told you that you would ideally want to enter at a 45 degree angle. So, um, I'm going to use this one over here and start banking the aircraft this way. Just like that, if we see it is now banking towards this white line. I want it to be intersecting this white line at about a 45 degree angle. So I will continue turning our course just like that until it looks like a decent angle to intercept this localizer. This is the localizer, this white line right here that's shooting out straight from the runway. And you will know whenever you enter this localizer, whenever this green line gets pushed over and it is almost like a straight line. This is what I was saying. So our aircraft's here and our line's right here. This means we are too far to the left of it, which makes sense. We are too far to the left. All right, I'm gonna descend a little quicker here. All right, and now we see this line is starting to move. And once this starts to move over, what you wanna do is engage your APR button. It's the approach button right here, and I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And now we see it's a straight line. And what it's doing right now is it is lining itself up with this runway that we can see on the G1000 actually. And it is, it is manually adjusting the glide slope. This is what this G over here is and this diamond. You see it's all the way at the bottom. That means I'm way too high. So which is why I'm trying to rapidly descend. And remember I'm going to in I'm going to make it 107 knots to make it descend quicker. And eventually the aircraft is going to take over the altitude itself for the glide slope. And this diamond is going to start rising. I'm going to decrease my altitude further. At this point this is where you turn on your taxi lights and get all your lights running and start to lower your flaps. All right, and we see this diamond is starting to come up now. And it says GS right here, glide slope. It no longer says flight level change or altitude hold at 1500 feet. And we have a localizer. This is what we want, guys. We want this diamond in the middle here and this localizer in a straight line, just like that. And I don't even have to look up from my aircraft in order to land this or all the way down to minimums because I can see the runway here for one and if we were in cloud then I would know since this localizer line is straight and this glide slope is good that we are exactly where we need to be and we can look up and see the runway right there alright guys and this would be just your final approach procedures you'd want to slow down a little more and we see our pappy lights are red over white which is a perfect I'm gonna go ahead and get my flaps down to two and we are perfectly in line with the runway now if there was very thick cloud cover right here then this is the moment that you would um, determine your minimums and typically minimums is 200 feet above where you, whether you decide to go around or not and by the way, if you did decide to go around, that's what this BC button is. It's the back course. It pretty much flies this in reverse, so it'll keep you in line with the localizer, but flying the opposite way. All right, and eventually, once you get really close, you want to disengage the autopilot like that once you are able to see the runway if you are in ILS conditions and take over the aircraft yourself and land the aircraft, just like I am doing here. A little high there. And there we go, touchdown. 
All right. So guys, that is how you perform an ILS landing. Now the Cessna, unfortunately, doesn't have an automatic land like some of the commercial airliners, like the Airbuses and the 747s do. But that is just fine. As long as you can get lined up and on a very good glide slope, you really don't even have to touch the controls until you need to flare. So I hope you all learned something valuable from this video. I hope you learned how to use the Garmin G1000 on the Cessna 172. I will be doing more tutorials on some more aircraft. I will also be doing full flights on some aircraft here soon, including the uh, Cessna. And um, I'm actually going to be live streaming here soon. There we go. We are parked at... Oh, I forgot to raise my flaps. <laughs> that's whatever. Alright, so yeah, that's going to do it for the video, guys. I hope you guys learned how to use the Garmin G1000. Um, in later videos, we'll, we will be covering the TBM40, or whatever it's called. I know it's TBM. And the Beechcraft Bonanza, and the Baron, and all that good stuff. The King Air. And there will be live streams here soon. Uh, if you have any trouble with getting an ILS approach in this Cessna 172, then um, feel free to leave a comment below. Or you can also join the Discord and we can help you out there. The link's in the description. Alright guys, and if you're new to the channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will see all you guys in the next video.